Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. We decided to revisit the centre of the region and find some hidden gems, places that are not quite so famous, but still just as beautiful. Today, you find Ross, Widget, Gizmo and me in the wonderful Oxfordshire town of Banbury. Now, some of you may remember many years ago when we came in this direction and decided to sidestep this town because Evans, the author of our wonderful guide, was quite rude about the church here. Now, we've come back just to make sure that he was right. Part of the reason is that our new edition of Evans will be coming out extremely soon. So we're pleased to be able to give you advance notice of that. But the other thing is, we're not entirely certain we agree with Evans's view. Come with me, I'm gonna show you around. Looking at the Church of St. Mary today, quite clearly early 18th century in origin, it's peculiar to imagine that on this very site there once stood a huge medieval church. Just a parish church, but so spectacular with its massive central tower, long and lofty nave and gabled transepts, that it was often referred to as a cathedral. Surely nothing short of a catastrophe or natural disaster can have swept it away. Well, actually, the church was systematically demolished in 1790. As Evans says in a tone of incredulous fury, incredible as it may seem, the splendid edifice was deliberately demolished in order to save the expense of a few necessary repairs and to put money into the pockets of interested persons. He tells us to look at Beasley's record of the events to hear the full story, but today you only have to invest a small sum in the excellent souvenir guide available in the new church to hear quite enough about this terrible scandal. Certainly there can be no denying the determination of the burghers of Banbury in the late 18th century. It's no joke demolishing a building like the one that stood here at that time. The destruction of the tower, which rested upon great square Norman pillars, was a formidable undertaking. But the Philistines were not to be balked. Timber and wedges were laid beneath it to give it temporary support, and then the pillars were partially knocked away. Fire was applied for 24 hours to consume the timbers which had been substituted, and at the expiration of that time, the noble pile fell down, burying the parts beneath it amid its ruins. 120 years later, and 118 years ago, this sad tale affected Evans to such an extent that he fled the town in despair, describing the church that replaced the medieval St. Mary's as the nadir of ecclesiastical architecture. He didn't return. We have, and frankly, I'm glad we decided to do so. Now, this town has its fair share of social challenges. According to the above-mentioned guide, the area around the new church ranks amongst the 15% most deprived areas in the whole of England. This is a rather remarkable statistic, considering this county is one of the richest. It is, however, at heart, a beautiful town. Many of you will know of Banbury, either from the nursery rhyme with its famous cross to which the lady rode her rocking horse, or perhaps the Banbury cake. Banbury cakes are described as oval-shaped puff pastry confections with a succulent, delicious filling made of currants and other fruit and spices. The puff pastry shell is covered with a sprinkling of cane sugar. They are delicious, and whilst probably adapted somewhat over the years, are supposed to stem from the time of the Crusades. The cross no longer exists in its original form, 
but a Victorian replica stands proudly in the centre of the town to remind us of the fame awarded the community by the Rhine, which goes as follows. Ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross to see a fine lady ride on a white horse. With rings on her fingers and bells on her toes, she shall have music wherever she goes. It has been suggested that the fine lady in the rhyme may have been Lady Godiva or Elizabeth I. More likely, it was a local girl who rode in a May Day procession. The original cross was pulled down at the end of the 16th century, and the present one erected in 1859 to celebrate the wedding of the then Princess Royal to Prince Frederick of Prussia. The colour of the stone used in the building of Banbury is the dark reddish sandstone we've seen before so often in this area, perhaps most obviously shown in the building opposite the church, the Waitley Hall Hotel, once an inn called the Three Tons. It was here, in 1778, that John Melchair sat at the window of his room and drew this view of the great medieval church. The picture now sits amongst the manuscripts in Corpus Christi College in Oxford. And so we come to the new St Mary's Church and to what the Gothic antiquary J. H. Parker describes as a hideous square mass of stone without form or proportion or a single redeeming feature. When it was first built in the 1790s, the design by S. P. Cockerell was indeed plain and rather austere, aiming probably for a kind of severe Roman grandeur, but nonetheless architecturally accomplished. The inside was white and undecorated, and looked perhaps a little more like a concert hall or a playhouse than a temple of Christian worship. It received terrible reviews at the time, as we have seen, but over the years it has been richly decorated and furnished and now, ironically, serves brilliantly as a concert venue for the town of Banbury and its surrounding communities, as well as an extremely active parochial church, looking after the interests of the local community that both needs and appreciates the effort. In 1860, a young Henry Back was appointed priest at Banbury, who himself appointed Arthur Blomfield as architect of the church. And it was the latter who had the vision of reverting to the earliest arrangements of Christian churches, namely that of the Basilica, and he set about turning St Mary's into a place of worship, as well as more secular activity, based on the gilded 12th century church of San Clemente in Rome. The work started in 1864 with the decoration of the main body of the church, paid for by donation, and with the steady introduction of stained glass windows. A distinguished firm of church decorators, Heaton, Butler and Bain, were to see the project through from inception to completion. The upper windows illustrate the life of Christ, and the lower ones his parables with a simple Christian message. Much of the glass was designed and made by Alfred Hassam, at that stage an extremely young man, who had he lived would undoubtedly have come to be recognised as his generation's outstanding glass designer. Sadly, he died of tuberculosis at the age of 26. Don't hesitate to visit this extraordinary building. It may easily not be to everyone's taste, but it is certainly worth an hour of anyone's time. For us, the extremely friendly welcome from the volunteers who look after the place day by day, plus the fact that they sent me out to fetch Gizmo and Widget, who I had tied to a boot scraper outside the church, and to bring them in for a treat and a drink, confirmed to me at least that this place is in extremely good hands. I do hope you've enjoyed our little spin around Banbury. I've got a feeling we sort of have put it right a little bit, our rudeness about the place so many years ago. I suppose everybody's fallible. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can find us on all the normal platforms. And we will see you again extremely soon somewhere else in the Cotswolds or nearby. And don't forget, watch out for the publication of our new edition 
of Evans Highways and Byways in Oxford and the Cotswolds. We're very excited about it. It comes out soon.